Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. Today we examine health and wellness in the Asian American community and ways to improve our lives. And I follow one man's emotional and inspirational journey with MS and how he's making a difference. We'll have that and much more. Paul Lin talks with women combating the silent disease of eating disorders. Mike Gilliam reports on the rapid rise of South Asian diabetes epidemic. And Minnie Rowe explores the inner canvas, art therapy that heals the soul. It's a little known fact that eating disorder is one of the leading epidemics with young Asian Americans. Paul Lin has that report. I had anorexia when I was um, in high school and it was a very, very rough time for me. From the outside, it would have been hard to tell. Jessica did well at school and competed in sports. She's always pushed herself to excel. She graduated cum laude from Harvard and now works in the financial industry in Manhattan. I'm from China, my parents um, are also from China, so it's kind of in the culture to achieve and to strive for the best. As a teen, that also meant looking her best, or at least getting to what she'd pictured as her ideal body based on TV, music videos, fashion, what she could see of the outside world from where she was living at the time in Iowa. I thought that I had to lose a lot of weight to, like, to starve myself. And because I was very much a perfectionist and I wanted to achieve my goals, I went to the extreme in order to do that. Young Asian Americans, mental health experts say, have a cultural drive for perfectionism and pressures from American assimilation that can manifest into eating disorders. They say, I know that I might get sick. I know that this is not normal, but still I want it. And that's the problem, you know, the, they're so, they have this firm conviction to get there, to, to be like 90 pounds or 75 pounds. You know, uh, talk about Dr. Dingra sees plenty of teens at the Child Center's Asian Outreach Program. He says traditional ideas about food, a symbol of abundance and prosperity, can make it difficult for those dealing with eating disorders. If a family migrates from a rural part of, say, China or Korea or India to uh, America, they have absolutely no clue what eating disorders are. So even if a child does go to the parent and say that I am having this problem, they wouldn't understand. Without support of parents or proper medical diagnosis, teens needing help may not get it, and that can be fatal. Nationally, eating disorders have a 20% mortality rate. It's the highest of all mental illnesses. And 90% of people with eating disorders don't get the help they need, including Asian Americans whose cultural associations with food and body image can be an issue. In Chinese culture, food is very important. Um, whenever you meet someone, one of the first things that you say is, have you eaten? Or they say, oh, you look skinnier or you look fatter. But it's not just Asians. Many other cultures view food as precious and scarce. So says Liana Rosenman, who recovered from anorexia and co-founded Project Heal as a teenager. It helps people who want to recover from eating disorders pay for the treatment. I caught up with Liana at Montanito, one of Project Heal's treatment center partners. She recalls stories about her mom growing up the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. I remember her telling me that she had to clear everything on her plate and the way that my grandma showed love was through food. And food is something that you don't throw away. Liana's brother understood that, but ate too much. Liana took the other extreme, focusing on healthy eating. By the time she was 12, she wanted to lose five pounds. She got a lot of compliments at her bat mitzvah. Just a lot of positive attention around my weight. And after my bat mitzvah, I decided that I wanted to keep going. And I kind of can relate it to a drug addiction in a way. The scale became my drug. As it was for Jessica. She wasn't eating much at family meals, hiding her rice in a napkin to throw away later. Carrots and celery became dietary staples, and she withdrew from social events, self-conscious about her eating choices. The numbers on the scale kept dropping, and she felt a sense of accomplishment each time, until she lost control. The bones were kind of sticking like out of my butt, and it was just very, very painful to sit down. Um, I also noticed that I was losing hair, which is kind of terrifying. Jessica talked to her parents, getting more support from her mom, 
Eventually, she had regular visits to doctors and a nutritionist. But the progress finally came when she was able to open up. I think the most helpful part was just talking to the doctors and understanding that I wasn't alone and that there were other people going through the same problems and they were able to recover. So this was, so there was a light at the end of the tunnel. That kind of support is something patients get from the Child Center of New York. Its Asian outreach program treats young Asian Americans with eating disorders and other mental illnesses. And the therapist focuses not just on the eating disorder, they focus on other symptoms of other psychiatric problems. They focus on the social situation. Treating eating disorders is expensive, and not all insurance covers it, especially residential stays. With 24-7 staffing, doctors and nurses, therapists and nutritionists, one month stay can cost up to $30,000. Project HEAL helps pay for that treatment. We just realized how many people want to get help but are turned away, and money is the only thing that's standing in their way. Project HEAL also provides education and other support, and it shows that recovery is possible. For Liana, now in her 20s and a first grade school teacher in Manhattan, Project HEAL is a way to give back by helping others overcome eating disorders. Since 2008, Project HEAL has funded 20 applicants um, from all over the world, the youngest being 12 and the oldest being 35, and they all have incredible stories. What's really special is that it really is people from all over the world, all different ethnicities, genders. No one's immune to an eating disorder. For Jessica Zhang, it took about one year to recover from anorexia. Weight goals were set, and she met them. But even more important were the changes she had to make within to regain her sense of self-value. I don't really compare myself to others. I don't compare myself to, you know, what to the media. Um, for me, I I have my own value system. Jessica also gives back by volunteering at Project Heal. And if she ever has to de-stress and let it all go, she now uses a creative outlet, a coping skill that she didn't have in high school. What I love about oil painting is that it doesn't have to be perfect. If I make a mistake, I will just paint over it. It's always evolving, it's always flowing, and you don't have to be precise and perfect. There can still be good and bad days for those who recover from eating disorders. Recovery is a hard road. But for Jessica Zhang and Leanna Rosenman, getting back their lives and helping others regain theirs is what it's all about. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. Up next, diabetes is an alarming issue in the South Asian community, and the numbers are staggering. Mike Gilliam met up with one New Jersey doctor who's turning that around. You have to get out into the community and just shake them up and say, hey, wake up, wake up. This is what's going on. Wake up and smell the coffee. Dr. Naveen Mahotra is a pediatrician and diabetes expert. He's focusing on diabetes in the South Asian community and creating a greater awareness of a problem that he says affects far too many people to be ignored. India is going to be the diabetes capital of the world by 2020. So one out of five people in our community are going to have diabetes. So it is of epidemic proportions. One out of five, that's an astounding number. Yes, that is. But the majority of the people think it's a way of life. Oh, everybody has it, so why even bother with it? Tell me about your personal experiences, your family, and how that led you to do this work. Diabetes has been a major part in our family. From what I remember, there have been so many family members of mine that have had diabetes, including my father. He had developed diabetes when he was in his late 30s and developed complications from it and eventually succumbed to it went in for just routine surgery and didn't make it out because his diabetes was so aggressive. And everywhere he looked, the disease was ripping apart his family. When I looked around, my aunt had it, my uncles had it, my cousin, he was in his 30s, and he had cardiac arrest three times because of his diabetes. In fact, medical problems threatened to destroy the young doctor's life, but he didn't withdraw. Instead, he formed something called the SKN Foundation and fought back. SKN is an acronym for three family members who have died. S uh, was my grandfather's first name, Shri. 
Krishna was my dad's uh, middle name and N was my wife Nidhi. So Sri succumbed to, at a very young age, from medical errors. Um, Krishna, my dad, succumbed at an early age from diabetes. And Nidhi, my wife, uh, passed away from cancer at a very young age. So it was kind of an effort to turn tragedy into something positive? Uh, you can say that, yes. Uh, so during that time of feeling tragic, um, I felt I needed to go back into the community and just help them wherever I can. How they had helped me through all of my situations. Dr. Mehotra is doing that in a number of different ways, including talking directly to people about the dangers of diabetes. They even have a sheet outlining risk factors that's a real attention getter. Being of Asian descent to begin with is a risk factor, and you can't do anything about that. That's okay. Being of a certain age puts you at risk. But there are certain things that you can do. So if you're a male, and your waist size is over 35 inches, you better get that waist size down because that puts you at very high risk for developing diabetes. If you're a woman and your waist size is over 32 inches, that puts you at very high risk for diabetes. He's also challenging the South Asian restaurant and catering industry to push healthier foods at restaurants and weddings. That includes teaching chefs to modify cooking and menus. They ask him to cut back on the foods that spike sugar levels and diabetes or are otherwise unhealthy, like white rice, refined flour, added oils, and sugar. We said to them, our community likes to go out and eat, especially on the weekends. They love to get their money's worth at the restaurant. Why can't we offer a healthier option at your restaurant? Let's think about what our moral responsibility is. Eventually, restaurants and caterers got on board and found that many people like the healthier alternatives. And they're putting young people on the path to a healthier life through a wellness program in elementary and middle schools. It's called Move It to Lose It. Kids can sign up for it, it's free of charge. So they learn half an hour of good nutrition, healthy eating, what the food groups are, how do you look at calories, how do you tell your parents, hey, let's eat healthier, and then half an hour of uh, physical activity through dance. Mayholtra says the program started in one school. Now it's been expanded to all the elementary and middle schools in Edison Township. The kids really learn what it's like to have a healthier lifestyle early on in life. And that's what stays on with them for the rest of their lives. He hasn't stopped there. Dr. Mehotra is also involved with First Lady Michelle Obama's Partnership for a Healthy America. He's also been providing training to healthcare providers on how to be more culturally sensitive to the South Asian community. He says all of this is about saving lives. The message is that Diabetes is real. It's of epidemic proportion. We need to take charge and make sure that we don't develop diabetes. And if we develop diabetes, we need to take charge and manage it appropriately. Imagine not being able to take the subway or grabbing a cup of coffee at your favorite restaurant. Well, one young man is trying to make New York and beyond more accessible to everyone. At 25, Jason Da Silva seemed to be on top of the world. This was me five years ago. Making documentary films and traveling the world. He was fulfilling a childhood dream, working as a successful filmmaker, but his world soon came crashing down. In 2006, at 25, he was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. MS is it's a neurological disease, which means that it, it affects your brain. So there's actually nothing wrong with my body, but the connections in the brain are being taken apart. And it's so it's like your brain tells your legs to do one thing, but the message never gets there. Soon after being diagnosed, he decided to turn the cameras around and chronicle his journey. Honestly, it was the fact that I was going to so many doctor's appointments that I was losing time to work in film. So I just took the cameras with me. That was like my practical reason why I first started. Then I realized how much potential it could have to help other people, and then I felt more impassioned. 
The film, When I Walk, is a poignant personal story, at times heartbreaking and also inspirational. We see Da Silva getting progressively worse, first walking with a cane, then needing a walker, then finally a wheelchair. Da Silva, who lives in the Lower East Side, realized he took many things for granted, like getting a simple cup of coffee at his favorite cafe. It's too hard. I don't know how much longer I can stay in New York. <laughs> well, you'll find ways to live here. If yeah. you really want to live here, you'll find a way. The more and more that I got worse and the more and more I was getting around New York, I realized that it was going to get harder and harder to be here. As I go from a cane to a walker to a wheelchair, it's just because New York City is not the optimal place for being in a wheelchair. Can I ask why you decided to stay here in New York? I honestly decided to stay for two reasons. One is like, it's my home and it's the best place for me as an artist and a filmmaker. Then two, I didn't mind. It, there was a fight that needed to be fought. I didn't mind being the person to, to help with that fight. And that fight was to make New York City an easier place for those in wheelchairs and physically disabled to get around. There are no accessible cabs. And there are a lot of places I can't get in anymore. So all of a sudden, I started noticing the steps and stairs that I wouldn't have otherwise noticed. And it was, it was kind of like a, I did, my mind did a switch over where all of a sudden now I had to think about certain places that I'd always go to, the coffee shop, the Starbucks, whatever it is, and whether or not there was steps to get in. So I had to think about that. And yeah, I just want, I, I wished that there was an easier way to know if the place had steps or was accessible. He and his wife, whom he met while filming, created the access map a user-generated map that allows people to rate businesses for handicap accessibility. Users can rate places from one to five stars. Huge entryway, totally flat, uh, no lip here whatsoever, and no heavy door for anybody to open. I'm going to give this place five stars. And it has expanded beyond New York. De Silva and Alice also help host mapathons around the country, with volunteers going out and rating businesses. And based on the user ratings so far, he's discovered some interesting data about New York City, where there are many older buildings. What is the most accessible place in New York? What neighborhood have you found to be the most accessible? The Upper East Side is actually, because they're doing a really good job with um, helping their aging population. So they're doing, they're making that the most friendly neighborhood right now. The worst neighborhood is probably where I live right now in the East Village. It may be tough for De Silva to get around in his own neighborhood, but he isn't planning on leaving anytime soon. De Silva says businesses don't have to spend thousands of dollars on revisions. They can get a portable ramp. And they could just have it for people that want to get in. They could lay down the ramp. Somebody can just come inside. But the problem is that people don't think about it. So like I would bring, like I have my own ramp and I bring them to places that I would want to get in but wouldn't be able to and they're like, whoa, where'd you get that from? You have your own ramp, a yes. portable ramp. Just cause I can't handle it anymore. So I want to be able to go get the coffee or go to some place for a business meeting or whatever it is. So I just said like, screw it, I'm just gonna get my own ramp. De Silva and Alice are now raising their son in New York and he's working on another film. After all, his journey continues. But I'm working on a new documentary, and that's looking at the next step of getting worse or getting better, and then also having a child as well. So are the cameras on right now? <laughs> no, 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 they're not, they're not. So you're just gonna- But they, they would be otherwise. If I wasn't doing this, they would be. I'm Minnie Rowe. This simple piece of paper can be a window into the human mind. Some psychotherapists are using the Asian art of origami as an unconventional method to tap into the subconscious. On the surface, this may look like a group of people learning origami, or Japanese for folding paper. And make a nice crease at the edge. 
but it's actually a group therapy session in progress. The instructor, Toshiko Kobayashi, is an art therapist. While these men work on mastering the creases, the bends, and the hidden folds, Kobayashi is quietly observing them for clues. It's a very simple movement, so we can free associate these other issues. This group of men are outpatients at the Community Services Program at Bronx Psychiatric Center in New York City. Many attend Kobayashi's group every week. Most of the people have uh, the mental illness and the combination of uh, substance issues and also um, homelessness. And uh, because of that uh, combination of uh, mental illness, sometimes they have to, I mean, they have a lot of difficulty in their life and then uh, end up in prison system too. Kobayashi takes her cue from her clients, as she calls them, and lets them call the shots on how to lead the session. Today, one of them picked the theme home as their project. Today, we are going to fold something very important for us. As the men worked on their paper houses, Kobayashi steers the conversation to coax feelings and thoughts out into the open. You built your house? Yes, I did it. I made sure I put out windows, mm. no door, just windows. Oh, <laughs> only, how, how can you go into your house? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Kind of a safe house, maybe. Yeah. Nobody can easily get in. Why it is um, therapeutic is because the, uh, it is step-by-step step, uh, breakdown to the uh, one step at a time. So it is a good way to build relationship. For over 12 years, Kobayashi has been offering origami workshops as part of the larger art therapy program at Bronx Psychiatric Center. Clinical director Joseph Battaglia says it is one of the most popular group therapy sessions at his hospital, often drawing a standing room only crowd. If you just put a blank piece of paper in front of people, some are inhibited, sort of intimidated by that. Whereas origami, you can start with following directions, but then you can put your, your own creativity into the process. While origami as a therapeutic tool is a relatively new concept, Art therapy as a discipline has been around since the early 20th century, although it wasn't called that at the time. It wasn't until the 1970s when psychologists coined the phrase. Art therapists are typically psychologists who are artists or have a strong background in art. Ikuko Acosta is the program director of art therapy with New York University Steinhardt Graduate School, one of the few degree-granting institutions in this field in the country. Why is art therapy an effective tool? Verbal therapy mostly use words, but as you know, we select and censor what we say, and we do that every day. Um, you know, when you say, some, someone asks you, how are you? And even you don't feel well, often you just say fine. On the other hand, the visual communication that does not rely on mostly words, on words, um, comes from both um, conscious and unconscious world. Because of this, art therapy is especially effective where there's a communication barrier. Children with autism, Alzheimer patients, domestic and child abuse victims, trauma patients, immigrants, Art therapy is also used in the prison systems, shelters, even in the Department of Defense for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's not just for patients either. Kobayashi leads a group of her peers in what she calls relaxation meditative therapy, an immensely popular workshop offered as a lunchtime escape from the rigors of the job. After um, dealing with patients in the morning. It's very relaxing and I'm not even concerned about whether I'm holding it correctly or incorrectly. It's just kind of um, fun to do and it's uh, visual and it's just, I feel much less stressful after doing it. But for all the accolades Kobayashi receives for her workshops, she is the first to admit that origami for therapy is still in its infancy stage. 
and more research is needed to advance the field. Educating them with uh, origami makes them um, a fine motor skill connected to the uh, brain um, development. We need to find out what exactly going on when we do origami in our brain. There's no need for scientific data, however, to measure the sense of accomplishment in this room as these men put a finishing touch on their masterpieces. A jumping frog, a sitting cat. How was it? I think you, you already have the... My first time making a cat. First, my, first time, are you yeah. sure? Yeah, yeah. And that is enough of a connection for Kobayashi to build upon. Until next time. Kobayashi is the founder of Origami Therapy Association of America, a nonprofit organization that works towards furthering research into the benefits of origami. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. Tune in next month. We'll take a look at what's hot in entertainment. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time.